man, I, uh, I don't have enough good things to say about Young Life. Um, man, God. Um, so my, my rookie There's year, this common conversation that happens. Shh. Put the hook around his neck. <laughs> um, my rookie year, I was living in a, uh, a studio apartment in Factoria, and my queen-size bed was basically right next to my oven. It was one room, it was miserable, I was so alone, and it, it was a really, really difficult season. And um, one of my best friends, his name is Ben Malcolmson, he was Coach Carroll's assistant. Um, he mentioned to me that he was a Young Life leader on Mercer Island, and I was looking for some friends, and he was living with two other guys at the time, and they were all Young Life leaders, and I had a heart for ministry, and so I moved in with those guys, and that was such a massive shift for me. Um, I mean, obviously, Young Life is all about reaching teenagers for the gospel, reaching them where they're at, which is so the heart of God, to step into other people's worlds, to step out of your comfort zone. Um, what it did for me is it gave me a purpose outside of football. That I mean, Football was its own little world that was not reality. And it made my problems with football not feel so big because whenever I would come home, I mean, it was every single day I was going over to the high school, which was just a block away from our house. And I was hanging out with high school kids and taking kids to camp every summer. And it was one of the greatest seasons of my life. Young Life also helped me uh, meet my wife. So let's go, Jesus. Come on, somebody. But um, I remember one particular story. Uh, there was a kid named Johnny who, he was a pretty soft-spoken guy, and he had been around since, I think I started hanging with him when he was in ninth grade. When he was in 11th grade, I took him up to Malibu, which is up in British Columbia. It's the most beautiful place in the world. And um, I never could really get a good read on him. Uh, and so one thing that they would do is you would try to get a one-on-one -on -one time with the guys that you have there. We had eight, eight guys in, in me. And these guys were like, it's, it's weird to say, but it's like all these high school guys were like my best friends. Because it was just such a fun, engaging relationship. And it was probably about day three or four, I met with Johnny. And um, probably like 20 minutes in, he just burst into tears and his dad was a really, really hard-working guy. They had, I think they had five kids. And um, we're just talking through a lot of the struggles that he's had. And he's looking at me with tears in his eyes. And he's like, oh, gosh, I'm in a real weepy mood, guys. <laughs> he said, I feel like you're my dad. I'll never forget that moment um, because for years it was just like, hey, man, how are you doing? And the impact for him and like what that meant for me. Um, and I still keep in touch with him. And, and that's what I love about Young Life. I, I went to some camps when I was growing up. I went to this camp called T-Bar M. And you would go there, and I went there with a couple of my friends, and I was there for a week, and we had these two counselors, and I only knew those counselors for seven days. And with Young Life, I've known these kids since 2011, and still in touch with them. And I really believe that the kingdom of God is, is about an intergenerational friendships. Like we're receiving from spiritual fathers ourselves and then we're giving it to other people because I, I also believe that we only get to keep what we give away. You know? It's like the, the reason the Dead Sea is a Dead Sea is because all the water pours into it, but does it, it doesn't go out. And so that's what Young Life was for me. It was an opportunity to, to sow into others and that's sow the heart of God. And... Um, Young Life Mercer Island, uh, since, since I had moved 
back to Texas, um, they, they had gone through some struggles and were unable to find an area director for a while. Uh, and that really, really broke my heart. I had a house on Mercer Island and um, we had the Young Life logo on the dormer of the house. And whenever you looked up Young Life Mercer Island, a picture of my house was up there. <laughs> it was awesome. And we were one block away from the high school and we were getting about probably 100 kids a week coming into our house and just coming over after lacrosse practice. And I would come home after a really hard day at work and there's like 15 kids in there and we're playing basketball or, or, or doing whatever. And it was such a life-giving season for me. Um, and so it is my favorite ministry and um, I, I would be honored if you guys would consider sewing into that ministry. Um, I'm going to stop because I'm going to try and stop crying. <laughs> so, exactly right. My guy right here. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, they're going to take to take a snap from from Clint. So I'm thinking from the center down, or is that way we can video it? It'll show on the on the video. Will that work? All right. So we're going to call you up here. You're going to come down here in front of this podium. Clint's going to snap you that ball. You better catch it. If you don't catch it and it goes past you, I'm keeping it. You get to take the ball home. He's going to autograph it for you. Ticket number nine three seven. Nine three, no. Now that wait a minute, it's going to be rigged. I'm going to be beat for that one. <laughs> Your stat. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Jared. Good job. Uh, ticket number nine five one. There we go. Come on down here, Clint. <laughs> you're gonna take that snap so you better better be ready for it not everybody gets to gets to take a snap from a super bowl champion long snapper best long snapper in the history of the nfl if you ask me i might be biased <laughs> yeah nice catch <laughs> he hasn't lost any zip on it, that's for sure. <laughs> so the last one, how are you on these? Yeah, he gets to keep the football. Okay. So the last one is the Seahawks Super Bowl champions football. So it's got the, the score. Anybody remember the score of that game other than Clint? Who said 43-8? There we go, Darren. No, you don't get it. Nice job. Yeah, I'll give you a hug. You want a hug? All right. So it's the last, the last item. Here we go. Do you want to wait for him to sign it? Oh, yeah, we're letting, uh, we're letting Clint sign this, so we're going to let the suspense here. Let me get the suspense even lingering a little bit longer. Say the first number only. <laughs> Ticket number eight. What? Yeah, so if you have a 900, I'm sorry. You just, you just fell. I... Ticket number eight. The second number might be nine. Ticket number eight, nine. And we're gonna we're gonna let the suspense linger because he's filling this out back there. Yeah. He is. It's one of a kind. This eight nine. Eight nine. One. Eight nine one. Ticket number eight nine one. Is that Lance? Lance got it. <laughs> yeah, I actually I'm gonna tell you why this makes me so happy. Because Lance is the one that came up with this idea. So No, 
He's not. He's not. He's my brother in Christ. All right, Lance, don't you miss this or I'm going to pull another ticket. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Hang on. Do you want to make him try that again? Do you want to catch that? No. Okay. Okay. All right. They, thank you, Clint, for for being a good sport for doing that. That was awesome. If I could get the huge board up here. The board, which is very large. Up here on the stage. Oh, yeah, no, no, we're going to do this. We're going to be up here on the stage. So I, uh, whenever they do that song, it wrecks me a little. So I'm a little emotional right now, and I don't get emotional very often, actually. It's the running joke in my house that I'm a robot. But that song wrecks me. So thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, the rest of the band. That was... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're all going to be up here. What is it? Derek sweating out of our eyeballs? All right. Uh, real quick, I, the band has been awesome. Clint has been incredible. But I want to give you guys right now a big, big, huge hand. So we raised $2,615 to go to Young Life. Nice work, gentlemen. Nice work. That was, that was all of you. Thank you for, for your generosity. Lives are going to be changed because of it. That is huge. I don't like standing in front of you guys. I'm not. I'm going to hide behind Willie. Um, so... Uh, I just I want to recognize these guys on the stage. So, um, for most of you who have been in attendance to this event before, you you already know this. But for those who haven't, maybe you don't. This event is put on by a 100% volunteer team. There is not a paid person within this ministry. We not only volunteer our time, our talents. We also volunteer our, our, our money we do as well. We, we put everything we have into this because we, we want to serve you. We want to serve our God. And to see this payout has been incredible. So if you would, give these guys each a hand for all the work that they've done. I'm going to sneak through. So another thing that we, uh, we like to do is we, we feel that the men that give of their time to come up here and share with us a message that God has put in their heart for us is, is much more valuable than any monetary exchange that we could have. And so we, we want to recognize them. And so um, and you guys have been to these events before. We've done a few things in the past. If you somebody get somebody to help me here. If you can sneakily pull that out of there. So, um, so one of Clint's stories kind of struck me a little bit. And um, we got we to make, uh, we got to right a wrong. Right a wrong that has happened in his life. So, with the first pick in the 2022 Men's Advance Draft, <laughs> Huge Men of God select Clint Gresham. I know. We're gonna we're gonna let him uh, we're gonna let him spread the COVID on down the line here real quick. <laughs> so uh, just a quick note: if you guys didn't know this, these uh, these jerseys are available not with Gresham's name and, and jersey number, but uh, with the our mission statement verse on there, Matthew twenty two thirty seven through forty. Um, 
so that you can order these jerseys with your name and that scripture verse on there. But this is for you. Uh, we often do re we refer to this event as our Super Bowl. If you guys recall, men's forums are our playoffs. This is our Super Bowl. So you got the, our Super Bowl emblem and date on there. But also, we, um, we wanted to make sure we got you for the, I mean, you, you put up a good game this, this, this week. So we got you a game ball as well. <laughs> you guys are awesome. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Clint, for, for everything. All right, one more hand for Clint. We're going to see him here in a minute, and I hope you guys are ready to be rocked tonight um, because he's going to bring it. Hey, Willie, come on back up. So I'd like to take a brief moment to induce our testimony guy tonight, Willie Rosenberg. I want to say one great thing about this ministry. I've been part of it for well over 15 years, and I have gained a lot of friends that are even within this room. But I got to tell you, this man is truly, in the years, probably five, six, whatever years it is, has become a friend of mine. And... You know, this last season where my wife went through breast cancer and still battling this man. And I, and I know, you know, and the funny thing about Willie is I know when he calls me and says, how you doing? It's not only him. He, he's got a partner. And I know that he's, that the, both of them, him and his wife are both praying. I know that. I know that that's just the way they work. So I know his wife's probably sometimes say, hey, what, how's that Jody doing? How's Dan's wife doing? But he's called me several times this season. It's it's been a blessing to me. I got to spend this last spring, summer, one day. We went out in my boat, and we went, if you want to call it fishing. Yeah. We didn't catch anything, but we got to hang out with each other. But just hanging out the day with this guy. There, if, if you want to be prayed for or you want to speak scripture and, or have some man speaking to you, this is the man right here. This is the man. I just, and I love you, Willie, and this is who's going to give us his testimony tonight. Is it okay if I stand down there? All right. So I, I want to tell you guys that you got a gift tonight, and I want you to realize what the gift was. It's, oh, oh, I didn't fall. It's rare that you have a man that comes up and gives you permission to be open. Clint, Clint gave you permission to open your life. You guys need to understand that. It's rare that you'll have a man come and tell you that I'm flawed and I have issues and I'm working through them and God is working with me. And what he's telling you is you have permission to say you are flawed, you're broken, and God is working with you. You know, oftentimes we get guys and look how great I am. You know, and I can tell you one thing for sure, we all come broken. And I think Satan's big trick here is to tell you that you're the only one. Okay, you're not the only one. So my testimony, yeah, my testimony is this. Life is hard. I want you to understand life has been hard and life is hard no, how, no matter how good it gets. You've heard this man tell you that he played on the highest level in the biggest game and life is hard. And as you, as you listen to him, and I'm, I'm paying attention because I, I relate a lot to what he's saying. As he went along in his life, there were bumps and there's road. And right when you think that you've done it, that I've made it, that, that everything's okay, everything still isn't okay. I was brought up in Compton. My parents moved to Compton. And before you guys go, oh, poor black guy, he, he was brought up in Compton. My mom's a professor, okay? My dad, my dad, you know, he had his master's. At, they moved us to Simi Valley, which sounds really good. That's where the Ronald Reagan Library is, and, you know, I still have a house there, you know? And um, you think, oh, that was great. We all have burdens to bear. We, have all, we all have um, things in our life that has uh, beat us up. 
all right, that's beat us up. Some of us, you know, I need my, Larry, grab my book right there. Some of us have been beat up by other people. Some of us have been beat up by abuse. Some of us have been beat up by, by our society. But we, we've all been beaten up by something. And then we carry that along with us as we get older. And, and, and when I say we've been beat up, it, and it's not some of us, it's all of us. Pick one thing or another, we've been beat up. So I had a great family. I had a mom and a dad. You know, we, you know, but what we were beat up by was society. We were the third black family to move to Simi Valley. Okay, my testimony, some people just start and they said, you know, I was baptized in Christ and God did this and that. You know, it, it's, a, it's a road. It's, it's, a, it's a long road. I was brought up in the church my whole life. And it's a long road. And this weekend, what we talked about was how people have made a difference in our lives. And I want you guys to understand what that means. So I was brought up in, in Simi, a lot of racial problems. I mean, they broke out. We bought this brand new house on the corner. They broke out our windows. You know, they didn't want us there. My teacher told my mother, who was a reading specialist, that I couldn't read. And I could read as long as I can remember. You know, I mean, it was insult after insult after insult. I get to junior high, and this is my first one. And I love, I went to class with the AC, the AC3 preacher. I went to his class, and this fit in. So he said, what are the mentors in your life? Okay, so I, I go to junior high. I'm 6'5". I have, really haven't grown since seventh grade. I'm being honest. I mean, I, it's like me, and then there's everybody else in class. I, you know, I haven't grown really since seventh grade. And so the mentors in my life, I get this coach, and he looks at me. He says, I'm going to teach you how to run the hurdles. I'm in junior high. I said, okay. So at first, you know, I got pictures of me just I'm jumping over the hurdles like this. You know, I made mean, the arc thing. And then I got better, and I got better, and I got better. And so I got from junior high. I went to high school. I ran a 9.5 and 100. 100 yards, I ran a 9.5. I was the fastest person in school. I was the biggest person in school. You know, and I wanted to run track. Of course, I'm on the football team, which I did not play my sophomore year. I did not play my junior year. But going into my sophomore year, I had this coach. And when I went from junior high to high school, guess what he did? He went from junior high to high school with me. You know, and he hung it. This is how foolish this man was. And, you know, I was a kid. He'd go to Europe for six weeks and leave me his house. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> you know, and he says, remember, this is my house and be respectful. I always did, respected his house because that's how my mom raised me, you know. But you think back on it, I'm going like, dude, what was wrong with you? <laughs> You know, and so he and he built trust into me, and so it's easy for me to sit and say, "I don't like white people," except I had this one white guy that poured his love out on me. So that's that's marker number one. Well, really, marker number one is my mom. My mom said, "You love people, and you take each one as they come." Okay, and I want to be honest with you guys. I'm a fighter. It is what it is. I mean. I mean, physically, I, I enjoyed it. I like it. You know, I fought in competition. I enjoy that stuff, you know. And so I didn't take a whole lot of crap off people. I'm just being honest with you. You know, this is a, I got permission to, to be open, so this is what I'm doing. <laughs> and, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't take a whole lot of crap off people, you know. And, of course, you know, I'm 6'5", so I didn't have a lot of problems either. So I go into junior high. And we have one of the best track teams in, in, the, in, the, state of, in the state of California. You know, we're, we're integrated as, you know, Asian guys, or black guys, Italian guys. We call ourselves the international this. And, you know, and we did all that. And we, and, and we had a whole lot of fun. You know, I'm going to church, you know, because in my house, unlike the kids today, that wasn't an option. On Sunday morning, you got your butt up and you went to church. And I mean, I don't even remember arguing about it. 
You stayed out all night, that was on you. You're getting up and you're going to church. So, you know, and I'm kind of learning about God. You know, but you, you know how you have bad witnesses? You know, oh, you know, the pastor's saying one thing, but he lives across the street from me, so I know what he's doing. You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, that part was bad. So I get into my junior, my senior year in high school, and I kind of want to play football. I'm already on the team, haven't played. I don't think I played a down my sophomore and junior year. Now, mind you, I'm running a 9, 5, and 100. We didn't run meters back then. They changed over to meters, so every record I hold is still there. Run a 9, 5, and 100. I ran a 13, 4 in the high hurdles. You know, and I'm thinking Olympics, you know, going, you know. No, I wasn't because there were people a lot faster than that. So I, I, my senior year, I'm like, I'm tired of sitting on the bench. So I hurt the two guys in front of me. <laughs> and so the coach literally had to start me <laughs> the first game. And most people say, well, what were you, a lineman? I was a running back. I was a running back, you know. And so um, I rushed for 200 yards my first game, you know. And then they made me captain. Now, that sounds all, oh, that's great. I was the first black person to play at Simi High to start in the game. This is not 1950. I'm not that old, although somebody accused me of being old. This is, I, I graduated in 1979. And I'm not talking down south, I'm talking California. Okay, so you guys need to understand where I'm going. So then, you know, my mom, I love my mother. You know, God rest her soul, I love her. I was the least kid that she ever thought would go to college. Okay, I want you to understand that. So I remember one time I, I brought home my report card and she looks at it. And remember, my mom's a professor, you know. I got C's. And I'm proud. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I'm proud. And she looks at it and she says, baby, you can do better than this. And I looked her right in the eye. I said, I know, but I don't do any homework. You know, she looked at me like, God, this is a dumb one, isn't it? You're the dumb one, you know? <laughs> so when I signed a letter of intent to go to the University of Washington, I still have this picture, that, that look of shock on her face. You know, my mom always said, you know, she never gave you the whole answer. She, she talked cryptic, like I went out to, with a girl, and she looks at me and she says, remember, you have sisters. the hell does that mean? You know what I mean? I, I, that's what I thought. I'm going like, okay, well, I'm not going out with my sister. You know, she talked cryptic to me like that all the time. And so when I went out to college, she was like, you know, you represent our family. I'm okay, okay. And then I go off to college. I, I'm at the dorms, and, um, and this is when stuff started to happen. Remember, there's people in your life that, and I still got issues with, with, with white people and other people who are not black, but I didn't have that, that, I think Clint called it that whole cushion of being able to be around people who are just like me. I had to be around people who were different than I was, okay? So I have this little white preacher that used to come to my door. You want to go to Bible study? No. I told him no 10 times at least. But one day I'm talking on the phone to my mother. You want to go to Bible study? No. And so my mom said, well, who is that? I said, this guy keeps coming to my dorm and asking me, do I want to go to Bible study? What do you think my mother said? She says, hang up, hang up the phone, go to Bible study, and then call me when you're done. I've been at that church for 40 years. I'm an, I'm an elder at that church, that exact same church. When we, when we think about the things that God, it's not just that one person. Who's the AC3 preacher that, yeah. Yeah, I went to his class, and he, and he talked about the mentors in your life. And I'm going like, you know, God must be saying something because all this is kind of coming together. When Clint was talking, I mean, I, I related a lot to what he was saying. You know, I mean, we, we look, at the, look up to these guys, and oh, they're football players. And, I, and I'm thinking, if you only knew, if you only knew how disastrous their life is, deals, if you only knew how 
it, it's hard to describe. And, and, and on Clint's behalf, I'm, I'm grateful because he's not giving out names. And I guarantee you he has names you know, of people, that, the brokenness and the pain and the suffering that he's witnessed, that I've witnessed. And the only difference, the only twist of it is Jesus. The only, the only thing that, that gets you through the, it was Jesus. Because, you know, and your mom's saying, you remember who you are. And, and she told me, you're the child of, you're, you're, my, you're my baby, you're a child of God. You know, so we, we, went, we went along and, you know, I started going to this church. And, and I wish I could tell you I changed overnight. I changed what I said overnight. But my behavior, you know, I was still chasing women, still getting high, doing that. I mean, something drastic had to happen in my life before I had to pull everything together. You know, and, and a lot of us doing that, we're coming here, we're at this great retreat, we're enjoying ourselves, and you're going to yourself, how am I going to change? Well, how am I going to make, how am I going to, you know, I see these people and we all got, we wear that, that church smile and we're all happy and kingdom of God, you know, I'm happy to be in here and, and inside, you know, you know, have I changed? Have, well, let me tell you something, guys. It is not your job to change you. You know, it is not your job to change you. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. I got baptized and nobody told me that. I know nobody, nobody told me that you know, so you know what I tried to do? I, I tried, I worked harder. And how do you think that worked out? It doesn't work at all. You know, all it did was really point out that I'm no good. It really pointed out that, that, that I had issues and I couldn't, I couldn't heal them. It pointed out that, you know, Willie, you know, you're trying to do this and, you know, you're just not any good. That, this is not going to work. You know, so I sat and I talk about this a lot in Bible study. I read Romans 6 through 8 for a year. You know how you read something and you know there's something there, but you can't quite grip what it is? You know, and I'm reading it and, and I, you know, I've gone through divorce. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, everything was great. But what I can tell you is God showed up. Amen. What I can tell you that when I trusted in him, and realized that I didn't have to walk it alone. I needed each our brothers. That God showed up. We were talking in, in our class today. You, this walk is not for just you to walk alone. You cannot walk singly. We need each other. And the problem with us as guys, I, I forgot the movie that I was telling them, you know, remember the movie where the guy was a runner and, and how he learned to run was his mom used to hang his sheet with piss stains on it and his, all his friends walked across and they, they saw him so he would run home real quick to take the sheet down. Anybody remember that movie? Or is that just me? <laughs> you know, that's kind of like, that's, that's us guys. We don't want people to see the piss stains in our sheets. We're, we're broken and we don't want to just tell people, you know, I got issues and I'm broken. You know, because if I do that, then you're going to realize that I'm not the strong guy that I was before. We had a guy come up here that has a Super Bowl ring that says, you know what, I'm broken and God is working with me. Amen. What a gift that, because that gives me permission, that gives you permission to say, you know what, I can't, I can't do this on my own. So pillar number two, Coach James. Truly a man of God. Now that doesn't mean he was easy on me. You know, that didn't mean I wasn't in his office every other week. But I trusted him to do the right thing. So I had my mom. I had Coach Green. I had Don James. And I had Milton Jones. Milton Jones was a pastor that, that baptized me, and I loved him. I'm just, we're, we're friends to this day. He runs CRF in Texas. Um, we used to be over there. Milton would come over. And we'd have Bible study, okay? And then we'd kick him out as we cooked chicken and you know, a bunch of stuff. And he smells all this good. But we would kick him out every week and get high. We didn't want to get high in front of the pastor, right? And so we, we would kick him out. 
And, and he told me later, he says, you know, I just wanted once to, to be able to eat with you guys. <laughs> it, that, it's so embarrassing to sit and tell you that. You know, we, you know, I'm going like, well, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. So James is giving me the wrap up sign. I guess I, I'm saying all this to say, guys, don't give up. I mean, take the gift that you're being given today, the gift that you were given with the ministry that, that Clint's doing, the things that he's telling you, because more than just being a Christian and, and wearing a name, I really want to live the life that God has called me to do. I really want to succeed in Christ. I want to be the child of God that, he, that he raised, he, he's raising me to be. I'm 60 years old, and it's not over. It's not over. So let me close in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for the gift that you have given us this weekend. And I ask you in the name of Jesus that our hearts are open, our minds are open. You open our eyes to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You didn't try hard enough. <laughs> Let's get into trying harder, right? Man, that's a, that, that was a tough testimony to follow. And thank you for sharing your heart, man. And you guys are blessed here to have that man speaking here. So, how we doing? Good. Yes? I, uh, I've been looking forward to tonight because um, this is one of my favorite. I, it, it, is, it is my favorite. Uh, stories that, that I have. Um, ooh, gosh. Let's light some candles, am I right? Just kidding, all right? Uh, tonight, I, I want to talk to you guys about the wound. The wound. Um, and... Uh, I have a feeling that just hearing that, there's a good chance that something could come into your mind pretty quickly. Some type of heartbreak, heartache, letting somebody down. We've all got them. If you survived childhood, you have a wound. <laughs> I actually say a lot. Uh, if you survived childhood, you have a book in you too. Uh, writing my book was was therapy, like straight up, it was therapy. Uh, I highly encourage you guys. If if you're not journaling, it is one of the best therapies, and it's free. That's the best part. <laughs> it's so so good for us. So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about John chapter four, verse one through twenty nine, and I'm going to read it from the message version, uh, just because it it just reads so well. It says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. She got busted. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> Understatement of everything. <laughs> Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking to that kind of woman. That kind of woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come see a man. Oh, this is so good. Come see a man who knew all about the things I did who knows me on the inside and the out. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for um, this weekend. 
Thank you, God, for how you are meeting us here. Thank you, God, that you're giving us all permission to come before you broken, asking you, God, to come and speak into our hearts. We welcome you here, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of the University of Texas Longhorns. I didn't have the grades to get into Texas. That's right, hook them, man. My dad played football at the University of Texas in 74, 5, and 6. He played with some guy. I've never heard of him. His name is Earl Campbell. I, who knows? So when I was a kid, we would go to all of the games growing up. And I remember walking into Daryl K. Royal Stadium, and there's like 70,000 people there. And I would look down at these football players and just, oh, God so loud. It was an unbelievable experience for me. And I'm there with my dad, you know, and he's got his T ring on and we would go into the Letterman's area. And I'm just like, this is unbelievable. And there was one guy in particular that, uh, I was, I was obsessed with this guy. I knew everything about him. I actually found out later, um, that he went to the same high school as my wife. Crazy. That's like the most bizarre thing ever. His name was Aaron Humphrey. He was a defensive end. Uh, when I was probably about 11 years old, one summer, me and one of my best friends, his name was Walker, we went to a UT football summer camp, and we were staying in one of the dorms, and we were getting ready to go down to practice, and I shut my door, and I lock it, and I look down the hallway, and it's freaking Aaron Humphrey. And I'm like, I like totally freaked out. And I'm like, Aaron! So I start like running down the halls. And I think, I think I scared him a little bit because he quickly got onto the elevator and was like, door closed, door closed. But we would not be deterred. No, 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 my friends. We knew that there were stairs here. <laughs> Ten flights, like I said. And so... Me and my friend Walker were basically like jumping from platform to platform, like trying to catch up to this guy. And I cannot believe we didn't break our legs. But in a miraculous series of events, we get down to the elevator lobby and we beat him down there. Come on. And I walk out and I'm looking around. I'm like, Aaron, Aaron. And the elevator doors open slowly. And this white smoke starts coming out. Trumpets are playing. Some angel named Gabriel, here he comes. And out walks this man. And he walks, this, this is what happened. I'm standing like right here. And he walks past me and he's like, what's up, man? And she keeps on walking. And I'm like, oh my God, I could die right now. <laughs> it blew my mind. I was so just excited. Because here's this guy that I just adored. And he noticed me. Have you ever met a hero of yours? Somebody that you held in really high esteem? I think it's part of the human condition to want to be seen, to want to be known, to want to matter. Which means that on the flip side of that is the question, am I enough? I don't care who you are or what you have accomplished, every single one of us have asked the question, am I enough? Do I matter? Do I have what it takes? We are indoctrinated with this kind of messaging constantly. Every single brand that has ever tried to sell you something, they want to convince you of a problem so they could sell you a solution. I don't want you to hear me on this. When God created Adam and Eve, he said, it is good. And ever since the fall of man, we have been asking the question, are we still? Am I enough? When my wife and I were getting married, I remember it was a very uh, kind of confusing emotional process of trying to figure out who do we want to have come to be at the most important day of our lives? And there was one guy in particular that, who was a hero and still is a, a hero of mine. Uh, 
And I, I remember I wanted to invite him to the wedding because he was somebody that spoke into my life. And so I sent him a text and I said, hey man, I would love to invite you and your wife to the wedding. Uh, would you mind sending me a good address for you? I said a good address, not your address, just to clarify, to give him, if you wanted to give me a fake address, that would have been fine. <laughs> and I didn't hear from him for two or three days, which like that whole time, it's like, oh gosh, I feel so exposed. <laughs> and two or three days goes by and he sends me a text back and he goes, uh, sorry man, I don't know it. <laughs> I'm like, come up with a better excuse than that. Like, give me a break. I get, Where do you get your mail sent? Like, you don't know it? Throw a dart on a map. Make something up. <laughs> and it's amazing how we look for evidence of the things that we already believe. We will find proof to justify the things that we already think. But the truth is, is that we don't have enough information to make these kinds of judgments most of the time. And when I read that text, what was communicated to me was not that, hey, listen, I've got other things going on, but it's you don't matter. Not just you don't matter to me, but you're not important. Which has been something my whole life I have been striving for. Am I enough? Constantly. Our brains fill in the gaps with all kinds of stories, trying to rationalize and understand. And we tend to be far more rationalizing than rational. And I think one thing for many of us is that the key is to accept our desire to want to be known, but not make it a requirement of people. And this was a guy who was very, very busy and had, a, he had several kids. And I, I have two kids and I'm barely keeping my head above water. <laughs> and so I, I have more grace for it now looking back, but in the moment it was, it was so jarring for me. And the thing is, if we begin to make someone's acceptance of us a requirement for our peace, then we have just made that person God. We have lifted this person up. And, and I understand, and I am all for heroes and mentors, but we also have to realize that we are all broken and fallen. And so we can't make that a requirement of people. And so when it comes to the wound that we can all carry, the first point I want to make is that it's human to want to be seen. It's human to want to be known. So when you look at this woman at the well, she was a Samaritan, which meant that all of the people of Israel looked at her and saw her as inferior. Racism is not a new thing. It has been around ever since the fall of man. We see someone who's different from us, and so we look at them and we judge them and we place them on these hierarchies. But our worth is not determined based on who's in the room. It's determined on the price that was paid. But when people all around you see you as less than, it is so hard to not see yourself like that. If that's the message that you're constantly being given, how can you get your head up to be able to see anything other than that? And when we see ourselves as less than, it's hard to live above the nature that God has given us. This lady was no different from us. So she was a Samaritan. But more than that, she was a lady that was sleeping around with a whole bunch of people. So not only was she physically different, but she was also doing things that everybody would want to stone her for. Am I right? When I read the verse, it said this kind of woman... But one thing that I think is so interesting about that is that this lady was no different from you and I. This lady wasn't some just dirty, disgusting person. This lady was a woman who was looking for a very real need for intimacy and connection, and she was trying to do it the only way that she knew how. 
It was how she saw herself that ca caused her to, to fall into a deeper and deeper sexual addiction, if, if you will, until she has an encounter with Jesus. And she goes back and she says, come and meet this man who knows me on the inside and on the out. I've always been wanting to be known on the inside because all these other men have always known me on the outside. And then she has an encounter with Jesus. She sees herself as God sees her. And that's how we need to see ourselves. If we want to like the person that we see in the mirror, we have to begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us, not through the lens of the heartaches that we have gone through. And until you see the value in you that Jesus thought was worth dying for, and that's an interesting idea. I, I, I know for myself, I can have this tendency to just sort of be like, oh, I'm so bad, like I am so sinful, I am the worst, I hate who, my, who I am, and I can get into the shame and condemnation. And, and Jesus is like, like, there is an element of that, but value is determined on the price that's paid. Jesus says that we were worth him? What does that say about us? What does that say about us? So this woman, she has an encounter and it changes her life from that point. She was going around like trying to get this wound that she had met, finding herself in this addiction and this addiction was only a symptom of this deeper pain that she was experiencing. And all of us have these aches in our hearts that can cause us to look to just whatever it is that's right in front of us. I just want to feel something other than the stuff that I'm feeling right now, even if it's just for a minute. I'm going to kick the can down the road further and further and further. And God's saying, that thing that you don't want to talk about... I like you for that. It's okay. I'm not surprised. I'm not grossed out. I'm inviting you into this encounter with me because I want to heal that. And so point number two is that Jesus wants to be your satisfaction. We will go to great lengths to be noticed if we don't receive God's love and healing. You know, I think about football players and how, you know, you have these guys who from as soon as they could walk, basically, they're being encouraged like into sports and then they get good at sports, you know, five, six, seven years old, they're given all this attention and really they're given a whole lot of love. That's what it was for me. I, I got moved up to the varsity when I was a sophomore in high school and let me tell you something. In Texas, getting moved up to varsity as a sophomore, that was bigger than a Super Bowl ring. For real, that was like status. I remember I was in my English class, and it was a Thursday, and Thursday nights were when the JV would play. It was my sophomore year. And my teacher walks in, and he goes, Clint, how come you don't have your, your game day stuff on? And I just kept my mouth shut. And like some girl in class goes, it's because he plays on Friday nights. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I should give you so much money for that. <laughs> that was so cold. I loved it. And I'm just like, oh, that felt so good. I didn't get my Letterman jacket until April of the next year. And it is hot and humid in Texas in April. But guess what I wore every day? <laughs> I am just pitted out on the inside of this jacket. It is so gross. But I'm walking around like, oh, gosh. I wish I brought my Letterman jacket tonight. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think one reason that athletes in general can move towards whatever sport that they find themselves in is because in a lot of ways, whatever that sport is, like think about it. If you're good at a sport, 
you're given love and you're given identity. The roles of what a father should be given. So in a way, sports become a father. But they're a messed up father. That thing that I mentioned the other day about how football is family, that is such a dumb thing. I mean, it can be, you know, like in high school, it can be. It's not in college because there's money on the line here. It's definitely not in the NFL. I mean, there is a brotherhood within the locker room, 